Welcome to From Jesus to Judaism, where former Christians share how they found the one true God. Now here's your host, Annie Hunt. Hey there, welcome to today's episode of From Jesus to Judaism. A few weeks ago, I had the great pleasure of having Steve Eisenhower of the popular YouTube channel, The Exodus Project, on the program. He shared his incredible journey out of Christianity into the true faith of Judaism. If you haven't already seen it, I will leave the link to that program in the description box below. Steve is back today and he is going to be talking about this incredible new book that he wrote called The Christian Coloring Book. This is an incredible tool for anyone who has come out of Christianity and wants to know more about the discrepancies between the New Testament and Tanakh, or as Christians call it, the Old Testament. I don't want to give too much away, but we had another fascinating conversation, and I know you're going to enjoy it. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Steve to the program. Welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you back, Steve. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm really excited because you wrote this incredible book. And yeah, thank you. I wrote a book. I don't know about the incredible part, but <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's so informative. And I think if anybody's coming out of Christianity and they want to know just a lot of the basic stuff, mm -hmm. as far as the discrepancies between Christianity and Judaism, and this is the book for them, right? It's called the Christian coloring book. And it's something that is sort of a part of the toolbox for right. every newbie mm -hmm. who comes into this knowledge. Sure. Yeah, and that that was really the the driving force behind it. I mean, a few months ago now I recorded a video called Coloring Book Christianity. And you know, the basic point was that they they color the Hebrew scriptures in the way that they want to make it look like it that Jesus is on every page, right? And I kind of ran with that idea because someone left a comment on said video and said that would be a cool name for a book. So I said, you know what? That's actually a really good idea. Um, so I started the Christian coloring book and I leaned into that idea of, you know, colors and crayons and um, basically using the Bible as, as a coloring book. I mean, you think about when you were a kid, you buy, you had a coloring book and it was black and white pictures on, and that was all, and you you colored in what you wanted it to look like. And that's really what Christianity did with the Hebrew scriptures. And I uh it I mean it's cute. It has it has little images here and there, little to make it look like a coloring book, right? Um, but at the at the core, it's it's really a reclamation of you know the Hebrew scriptures for what they are in the black and white, you know, rather than colored all over with um, you know, the colors of Christianity. And that was really my motivation was, was so people could have, you know, a, a quick and easy reference guide in their pocket to answer the missionary, missionary arguments. And I even, I used the KJV for all of the, all of the citations in the book. So people can't say I used faulty translations. <laughs> so I, I wanted to use like the Christiest, original translation that I could think of. Um, and even with that, you can still draw out, you know, the truth behind the, behind the faulty pages that were colored by the, the Christian ideas, you know? So that was, that was really the whole, the whole driving force behind it. Yeah. And let's talk about some of the topics. Okay. I have it open here on my, uh, on my computer. So I can. I know that you talk about the messiahship of Jesus, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of, of course, just from different, different, um, different standpoints. You know, for example, uh, my contents page. The first chapter is in our image, um, and how that's used by Christians to promote the Trinity. Uh, the second is the seed of woman, um, which, I mean, everyone knows Genesis 3, that the seed of the woman will destroy the serpent's head, right? They say that applies to Jesus. Uh, 
third chapter is without blood, there is no atonement, which once again, book of Hebrews brings that idea. Um, the fourth is that a virgin shall conceive, which, you know, is like one of their big ones that Jesus was born of a virgin. He was bruised. Isaiah 53, we go after in that one. Um, my hands and my feet, which is Psalm 22, uh, talking about if it was pierced or like a lion, um, if it was a prophecy about Jesus or not. And then finally, the final chapter is called Son of Man, which is focused on Daniel 7. I think that there are so many things that are glaring in terms of the way Christians have colored or yeah. tried to color the Hebrew scriptures. And it kind of amazes me because things are really black and white in Tanakh as far yeah. as what they're about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Christians want to make them a different color than black and white. Sure. Of course. And it just, it astonishes me though, because I've never really understood the mentality of how you could look at a story and read it at face value and know that it says this, that, and the other, and it's about whatever it's about. And then take that story mm -hmm. and make it about something else like the virgin birth. I mean, that's yeah. a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you want, we can talk about what that virgin shall conceive part talks about. Yeah. I think that's great to talk about that because people need to understand that this has been twisted to fit this Jesus narrative. Sure. And it's so wrong on so many levels and yet Christianity persists. And <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, explain <laughs> once again, <laughs> <laughs> Sure. If you don't mind, I can, I can actually share my screen and show a page from the book if you want. That'd be great. Okay. I just need screen sharing ability and then I'll do so. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So there, everyone, you can see this is basically how my book looks. You know, it's it's actually an ebook. So if anyone is interested in it, I can I can send you the uh the link. Um so this is the first the first page in the Virgin Shall Conceive chapter. Um, so the first thing, I start out with, no, I start out with the rainbow. Um, because we need context, right? The, the whole point of Isaiah 7, the Virgin Shall Conceive, is Isaiah saying to Ahaz or Ahaz, however you want to pronounce it, um, the Lord will give you a sign, right? Well, we need to understand what a sign is. So from the get-go, I begin with, you know, the original sign that we find in Genesis, and that's the rainbow, right? It's the same word in Hebrew. Here, right here. If my highlighter will work. <laughs> I don't know why it's not highlighting that, but uh, the word oat, which means a sign, it's the same word in Genesis in Genesis 9 here as it is in Isaiah 7. So it's clearly something you can see, right? When God made the covenant with Noah, um, he said, behold, I put my bow in the clouds. I give you a sign of our covenant that I make with all of humanity um, to know that I'll never destroy the world with water again. So if, if God hid that rainbow underground, would it stand as a sign? Luann? <laughs> it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. No, obviously you need to see something. Right. You need to be able to, it. you need to be able to see it. Right. And that's, that's why it's, it's visible. And, and what's very interesting is the rainbow occurs when it's raining. That's something that's very important um, because mighty rains and a flood destroyed the earth. So to, to show you like, hey, don't worry, it might be raining, um, like things might look bleak, right? But you're not going to be destroyed. And I put a sign there so you know that, right? That's the whole point of the rainbow. 
very similarly, Ahaz is in that same situation, right? So if we look at the if we look at the two kings in Isaiah seven, um, the two kingdoms that are bearing down, which are Aram, modern day Syria, and the northern kingdom, were in league and they were they were coming against the southern kingdom. Picture them as the reins, right? Um, so God says via Isaiah to Ahaz, he says, listen, I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to give you a rainbow to know that these two kings, a.k.a. the reins, are not going to be a flood that destroys you. But, And what's that sign? It can't be, it can't be a virgin giving birth because... I mean, is Ahaz going to sit in the room when the Holy Spirit overshadows this person? Or is the child the sign? Something you see, something that can remind you that, hey, things things don't look too good right now, but in time, um, you know, they're going to be okay, right? The the flood isn't going to overtake me, right? It's it's a very striking parallel, actually, how the rainbow and this, the same word, it's it's in my opinion, something very striking. Um, and it's, and it's things like that, that I really delve into, uh, you know, utilizing the Hebrew. I even, I even, as you can see, show the Hebrew in the book. Um, but it's, it's mostly just basic reading the thing for what it is. You know, what does the black and white say? If you were to read it like a book and not just go to this chapter in this verse, you know, if you were to read this like a book and let, let the book tell you what it's about. Are you going to come to the same conclusion? Is is really what the basic principle of the book is? And I think that's really the bottom line with it all is that you have to look at the book as a mm -hmm. standalone thing because sure. if you if you try to look at something that was written after it and make it fit, it, it's you have a lot of problems doing that. Sure, sure. So, because you can make anything fit if you use that rationale. Yeah. But these stories, especially here in Isaiah 14, 7, 14, it's, it's really clear what this is about in the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's a, there's a pregnant gal in play and this child that she's going to bear is going to be a sign that God has a has his back, right? Right. That mm -hmm. when he's old enough to know the difference between good and evil, God is going to intervene in this situation. And it's really clear. It's not like you have to read into the text to figure this out. It's spelled out so amazingly clear. And it's just preposterous to say that this is about somebody else named Jesus. <laughs> 700 years in the future. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, why would you even think that? And and this whole thing with Emmanuel. So suddenly, because this scripture was cherry picked, now all of a sudden, and Jesus isn't Jesus, he's Emmanuel. So <laughs> even that there is yeah. weird, right? Because right. he's Jesus all along, mm -hmm. or y Yeshua or whatever. And suddenly now he's also Emmanuel. I mean, it's just, it's very crazy to me to think about putting an idea and a concept into this passage that is so diametrically opposed to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Of course. And um, like I said, I use the KJV. So I even go with their translation. I say, fine. Like, I'll even go with your translation. But the point is, does the context support your claim and then honestly the the best they can come back with is well there's dual prophecy fulfillment and with that i mean if that's the route you have to take i consider that a win because it means you can see that the initial context of this has nothing to do with what you're talking about and you have to reformulate it into something else um and with dual prophecy fulfillment if that's the route that things need to take then Nothing is nothing is refutable, right? So, whenever, whenever we whenever we go into things like this and we discuss prophecy, and 
and so on. If if the missionary resorts to dual prophecy fulfillment, I'm speaking to the listener right now, you've won. You can put that in the W column because that means they just conceded that the context of the verses isn't what they're talking about and had to be basically revisited in a different way at a different time. Yeah, I, I, I think that if you really want to make a point on something that you, that you made up, mm -hmm. you can take any, any text anywhere and sort of string something together to try to make that point. I mean, all these religions have done that where they took over the original Hebrew scriptures and made their own religion. Mm hmm. And then they go cherry picking in the original scriptures to try to say, oh, well, this means this in our religion and this means that. Right. But come on now, people. Right. How <laughs> how does that yeah. not ring strange to you that something after the fact comes along and says that what I'm saying is true. And this thing that came before me somehow validates it. But not in the way that it looks. It's you know, it's like, but you have to read it this way, or and then it'll validate it. Let's just forget about what it actually says. Let's <laughs> just twist it around, and then it'll validate me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's you know, I use the the word I use rather often is nefarious. A lot of what we see go on in the the way the Hebrew scriptures were handled i guess you could say with the, by the new testament authors it's nefarious um means not good <laughs> it's a, it's a bad thing um and yeah and and throughout throughout the throughout the ebook we address multiple of what i consider to be probably the top 7 biggest misappropriations <laughs> There, there's so many, but I think you have really captured the important ones, like I said, for the new person coming in. Sure. Because these these are the topics that are going to get brought up in conversation when they go and tell their Christian friends and family that they don't believe in Jesus anymore. Yeah. They're going to well, throw yeah. them these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you're. I mean, you're not going to have the, the Michael Brown garbage arguments in – a basic conversation with your Christian friends out to dinner. You know what I mean? You're not going to be having all that, all that nitty gritty stuff. It's, it's going to be these big ones here. Um, did you, I mean, let's, let's role play. I'll be the, I'll be the, uh, counter missionary. You'd be the missionary. You say, if I were to ask you, um, why do you believe in Jesus as a Christian? What would you say? Because in the New Testament, he said he was the son of God. Right. And he died for my sins. And he died right? for my sins. And I'm in love with him, you know? So those those and are the main things. And he saved me. Yeah, and he saved me. And yeah. he saved me. Exactly. He saved me <laughs> from my sins. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's these more... People need to understand, before they start getting into, like, all the deep, real deep stuff, that the religions... Hmm. like a judeo-christian that's that's a misnomer it doesn't exist right judaism and christianity are opposing ideologies in the way they function the way they operate so uh that needs to be what's exploited at first you know is the basic foundational ideas that what christianity is selling judaism doesn't buy so that's really what I what I wanted to capture, as you said, was some of like the biggest <clears throat> the biggest things that any Christian could just quote off the top is incorrect, you know, and that's that need to be teased out. It's important that people understand the tactics that are being used to try to make these points. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting because even when they're presented with the points the Christians, they'll sort of pivot or something, or suddenly they don't want to be a part of the conversation anymore. 
because they can't answer. Like if you talk to them about the virgin birth and you show them what's going on, they kind of are stuck at that point. What do you, how do you explain it? Yeah. <clears throat> did you but, by chance, did you by chance see Rabbi Singer's latest video where he was like invited to a debate online mm -hmm. and like, wasn't, didn't even know what he was walking into. Yes. And, and the one fella, the one fella brings up Isaiah 53. And then when Rabbi Singer, like, shows him the true context the guy gets offended and says oh well um you didn't give me time to look it up <laughs> <And> <laughs> Rabbi singer was like i didn't bring isaiah 53 up you did you know so you can tell there's a very very fragile easily fracturable ego amidst the christian psyche right and i think i think that's actually a projection i think that's what christianity does is it tells you that you're so shameful and disgusting and totally depraved that if Jesus ain't it, you know, what could be, you know, and, and then you project your shame and your, and, you know, the way Christianity paints us as pathetic fallen creatures, as soon as, as soon as that's challenged, I, th I think it's a projection. I really do. And I think that's why they're so easily offended when their belief is challenged. Well, I think you and I have talked about this before, but it's the ultimate victim mentality. Yeah. And it's funny because with victimhood, people actually like being in that place because it's an excuse. Oh, yeah. It makes things easy for sure. Right. I can just continue to be a victim and I don't have to do my work. And of course, Jesus took it all anyway, so I don't have to worry about it because I can't wait to get out of here. Their whole thing is, I can't wait to get out of here and get raptured. Yeah. Yeah. Sooner death, sooner glory. I can't yeah. even tell you how many times I've heard all the old heads in church yeah. when I kids say that type of thing. So God put us on the planet so that we can sit around thinking how badly we want to get off of the planet. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. That's crazy. Right. It's, do they not think that there's a purpose here? Do right. they not think that there's work to do? <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. why would we even be here if we weren't to be working on ourselves and coming into alignment with God and learning about things that we can do to become the best version of ourselves? I mean, otherwise, what would be the point? Right. So and, and, there's, and, there's a reason for the experience, and, not to say, hey, let's just get raptured and it'll all be over with. Of course, of course, yeah, and man, it's 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 so sad. I was I was talking with uh, Rabbi Fedro the other day about generational curses. Um, we were talking about <clears throat> he and I are are putting together a couple ebooks that are going to be available rather soon that we're going to co-author together. Um, and generational curses was the, a topic of one of them. Um. And he and I were just, you know, spitballing. And and one of the things that really impacted me is if you think, sit down and just think about the generational curse idea, how like we're all messed up because we carry the sin of Adam on us, right? And I was I was thinking there day that the Bible says that every child is a blessing from Hashem, right? A, a gift from Hashem. Um, how sick would God be to... Give children. Um, we understand that people aren't going to have children unless Hashem wills it and makes it happen. Uh, that's that's really us partnering in creation with Hashem, right? How could it be a blessing if you know, he's just spitting out another fallen, disgusting human that's damned to hell if he doesn't believe in him? You know, it, it just it just really depowers God in all the things that Christianity proposes. That everything had to be rectified through the death of a God man, it depowers it depowers God in such a significant way, right? An Almighty God can just say, "Okay, you're forgiven." It's it's the it's the depowered evil God, right? That requires himself to die, or anyone to die for that matter. For me, you know, it's it's. It depowers him and it kind of like depowers us too, 
because we have free will, you know? There's, there's a lot of things that Christianity removes free will. I mean, even Paul says that people are predestined. Mm -hmm. um, significantly, yeah. we don't have free will at our birth in the Christian worldview, if you think about it, mm -hmm. because we're born evil, you know? <laughs> yeah. But you always have a choice. And even in the story of Adam and Eve, they had a choice before them. So they could have taken a different path. It's not like someone put a gun to their head and said, you know, eat the apple or whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They could choose. And so they were empowered to choose. Mm -hmm. And they didn't choose right. But that is life 101. So we're all able to make those choices, just like when God said to Cain, sin's crouching at your door, man, but you can master it. What the yeah. heck? I mean, that is so diametrically opposed to needing a mediator to forgive sure. you for your sins. Sure. I mean, exactly. you can master your own you sin. Master over it. Mm -hmm. How does that work with Jesus? It doesn't. But the problem is Christianity doesn't teach to search those Hebrew scriptures and look at them at face value for the way they were written. They're right. saying, well, we glued something onto this book and you need to read our book first and then go search those scriptures so you can verify our book. Yeah. And if you see anything that doesn't verify, then you need to read between the lines and keep reading until you see something. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. like a form of insanity, you know, mm -hmm. when you think about it. Because it's like, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Oh, yeah, 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 I see it. You know, it's yeah. like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so if you just look at the text for what it is, you, you say, sure. well, if God told Cain that he could master his sin, then that doesn't point to us needing even an animal sacrifice to atone, right? Right. right. That's just saying that we have the power within us. And the thing was, what was the sin? What was the sin that he was being reprimanded for? Because he didn't bring the best of his right crop. Yeah. Okay. Right. Which is, which is rather funny because he brought plants. If if he had brought the first fruits of his plants, that would have been just as acceptable as the fatlings of Abel's flock. Right. 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 And that's. Uh, I actually believe you know this. This is kind of interesting. The, you know, the mitzvah of shotness. A Jew can't wear wool and linen together. I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so a, a garment, a Jewish garment, can't have wool and linen in the same garment. It's called shotness, and it, like they have to check their clothes to make sure these two fabrics aren't mixed together. This actually comes from Cain and Abel, which is wild. Like how everything in the Torah is so intertwined. Um, Rashi brings, as well as other commentators, I believe, is in the Talmud, of course, that the crop that Cain brought was flax. And linen is made from flax, and it's a rather unusable, abundant crop. It grows very easily. Um, you can't really use it for anything. It's it's just kind of abundant and of little use. Uh, and that's what that's what Cain brought, and it wasn't acceptable because he said, "You know what? I have an abundance of this. I'll bring this." Um, and the wool, of course, is the sheep from Abel's flock, which I think was it's it's really cool, really cool that that mitzvah comes to not bring to mind that original that original um scenario there this is making my point about how christians including myself when i was a christian we just we just read what we wanted to read or what we were supposed sure, to read sure so we didn't really learn the truth about what these scriptures were saying or the order of the way things happened or anything it was just like, well, Cain had a brother and, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Cain was evil and he yeah. did this. And we we knew sort of the the gener generalities of the story, but we never really were taught the inner workings of all these stories. Right. Right, and of course. that's what's so important because that's why the Jews don't believe in Jesus because they know right. what these stories are about. Yep. And they're nothing to do with <laughs> <laughs> right and yeah. i always say why would if there was going to be somebody named jesus and he was going to come and die and rise and come again why wouldn't it have just said it in there 
Yeah. Why and would it be every a opportunity to do so? Yeah, just be yeah, plain about like, it. You know, I mean, why would it? Why would it be veiled? I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, God doesn't want us confused, but yet, but He allows confusion so that He we, He can sort of separate the wheat from the tear, right? Sure. To see who is going to believe His word and who is going to accept the word of something else. Mm -hmm. He wants to see that. So that's why he allows it. Sure. Yeah. One other big disconnect, you know, Adam and Eve really get a really bad rap from Christianity. Um, so much so that Jesus is called the second Adam, you know, you have Pauline second Adam theology, but when we really read the Adam and Eve story for what it is, it's like the ultimate coming of age story. Um, I mean, think about it. They, so everyone says, oh, well, the snake lied to them. I mean, did he, he, he says, if you eat that, you won't die, but you'll become like, like God is right. Knowing good from evil, they eat, they don't die right away. Right. So maybe they're going to die in the future. Um, but I mean, regardless of that, they didn't die. Uh, and what does, what does God say to the heavenly host? He says, man is now <laughs> like one of us knowing good from evil. So the, the serpent didn't totally lie. Um, and you actually kind of see some compassion, you know, the, the, the Christians try to paint Hashem as like this big evil overlord with, you know, a big white beard, just wanting to step on everybody. Um, but what does he do? You know, it says he moves around in the garden, you know, he, we know that God is omniscient. Is he playing dumb? Like, you know, hey, where are you? You know, of course he knows what went down already. You know, where are you? And they cover themselves with leaves. And he says, who told you you're naked? And what does he do? He makes them clothes. And then they're expelled out of the garden and they have to now till the earth. I, I think back to when I left the house. You know, my, my parents provided a beautiful household for me growing up. All my needs were supplied. Think of that as the garden, right? And then as I began to age, I started making the wrong decisions. And then eventually it was time to grow up and I had to get shoot out of the house, you know? And and the pep talk isn't, it's all going to be rainbows. No, the pep talk is life is hard. You're going to have to do some work. So, you know, time to grow up and do it, right? Right. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah so there's a point to it all it's not mm -hmm. just to come and mess up and say oh well i don't have to do anything to work on myself because it's in the end there's an afterlife and there's streets of gold and forevermore i'll be i'll be in bliss <laughs> you know so if that was going to be the case why wouldn't god have just had it be bliss from the beginning why all this nonsense that we have to go through right but it's about the evolution of the soul. Sure. And and I was telling someone the other day, I said, you know, when we wake up to the fact that it is about our soul's evolution and that we are tasked in this life with overcoming our lessons, learning how to become more pleasing to God in the way we think, act, what we do. I said, you know, then we're glorifying God. And, mm -hmm. and that's actually moving our soul's journey along. Sure. I heard Michael Skoback talk about how when you have evolved to a certain point in this life where you're very wise and you have learned many, many, many of your lessons and have overcome, when you transition from this world to the next, he says it's like it's easy. It's as easy as taking off one garment and putting on another. Hmm. But when you're kind of in a low level vibration and you leave, he said it's torture to sure. come out of this realm and try to move into the next. Hmm. So I thought that was beautiful and it sums up why we're here. And if we all put our focus on that type of thing and pleasing God with what, how we think, what we say, how we act and reflecting him as, as much as possible then 
he is praised. He is forever praised. Sure. Right. Yeah. I was, I said to Jim the other day, I said, you know, sometimes I just look at nature, the trees and the birds and everything. And I said, they're all in perfect alignment with God and in their world, all is well. Mm -hmm. Because none of these things are balking the system, right? They are just in alignment. And so the world runs like clockwork that way. Nature does what it's supposed to do. And, you know, (laughs) and it's like, that's, we, we need to look at that and take a lesson from that to subject ourselves Oh, okay. To, yeah. to our creator, right? To subject mm-hmm. ourselves to our creator and his will and his plan for our lives and to just show up every day for it, right? Yeah. Don't fight against it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. It's only when we fight against it, we get in trouble. And that's what I think Christianity is doing. It's fighting against this. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. Definitely. So you have a very flawed religion here because it's so out of alignment when it's saying that god isn't big enough or merciful enough Mm -hmm. or loving enough to just forgive sure right so let's take i know that we you know we have uh our limited time but let's take another chapter of your book and talk about it a little bit so the the isaiah 53 chapter for me was probably like my most favorite to write because the way I approached it was that I'm having a sit down conversation with Isaiah and I want him to tell me what Isaiah 53 is about. And like I said, it was, it was moving. It was a moving chapter to write. It was a fun chapter to write. And I think I've got, I've gotten a lot of praise um, from the readers that they felt the same way. You know, it was fun. It was light. You know, things got heavy, but it explained it very well. Um, and it's, and seeing that almost like a dialogue between myself and Isaiah throughout the chapter <clears throat> made it very easy to follow. Um, so you read the you read the book, of course. You actually wrote the afterword in it. What did you think of the Isaiah fifty three chapter? I thought it was very cleverly done. Like I said in my afterward, you do have a brilliant mind. And oh, I think you. you have a real gift for kind of seeing beyond what the average person can see. So I like the way that you put that forth because I've I've never seen it done like that as though you were having a conversation with him. And it, it makes it relatable and it also makes it easy to understand. Sure. Would you like me to actually read my conversation with Isaiah? Yeah, I think that would be great. Pardon me. Okay, so I begin that by saying, let us consult Isaiah on this very matter. The matter being the context of the 53rd chapter and the identity of the servant. So I I say, if I could ask him myself, I would imagine the exchange going something like this. Excuse me, Mr. Isaiah, son of Amos, sir. Who is the servant you wrote about in your 53rd chapter? And Isaiah confusedly responds, oh, well, that's rather simple question to answer if you just read the chapters beforehand. And he says, let me show you. So he would then pick, he would page through the book until he reaches the 41st chapter, where he would read the eighth verse. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. After a few moments, I would kindly retort, Surely you don't expect me to believe just one proof text, do you? And he would then page through the 43rd chapter and quote the first verse. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name, thou art mine. And he would continue to verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may understand, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Yea, I, even I, the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. He would then look up and with a righteous smile would ask, Is that clear? No, I would respond. I think you should even elaborate further. Oh, well, all right. 
He would then concernedly page to the next few chapters and deliver multiple citations, such as Isaiah 44, 1, which reads, Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. And then 45, 4, For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. And then Isaiah 49, 3, And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And then finally, I would smile and say, thank you. That was most helpful. And you were abundantly clear that Israel is the servant of God in whom he delights. But Isaiah, can Israel really be the suffering servant? And Isaiah's face would drop in seriousness. And he would say to me, he would say, my people have suffered through exiles. Destructions of two temples, holocausts, pogroms, crusades, and ghettos. Missiles from Hezbollah, forced conversions. Expulsions from both Spain and England, as well as baseless hatred via the media, even until this very day. We suffer at the hands of the nations around us, and we must bear their inhumane transgressions. But we do so hopefully awaiting the day that our God brings us back to our land. And then the whole world shall see that we are his witnesses and we are his servant. And on that day the nations will flow to Jerusalem and to the holy mount as the Torah shall go forth from Zion. And we shall be redeemed. Amen, I would say, with tear-filled eyes. Amen. And that's my conversation with Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was just so beautifully written. And again, it it makes it easy to understand in a more modern context when you put mm -hmm. it like that. And that's what people need because I think the Old Testament for Christians, what they call it, is daunting, right? Right. Because, but for one thing, they read it from a perspective that somehow it has something to do with them. And that's like, it doesn't, right. <laughs> it doesn't, it's about God and the Jews. And if, if you read it that way and say, well, it's not your story, right? then it's easier, but it's also right. got a lot of language in there that was what people were familiar with back in those days. So that can make it a little difficult to grasp everything that's being said, but when people like yourself can put it in a way that it's modernized, then the light bulb goes on, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, of course. So, of course. but I think they definitely need to get your book. How, how did they get your book? Uh, just send me an email, either find me on Facebook or send me an email. Uh, my email is rediscoveringgod22 at gmail.com or just find me on Facebook. Like I said, uh, it's free. Ebook is free. Um, but if you do feel the need to, you know, donate because it does get to be a lot bringing out a couple videos a week and writing books and, you know, putting together slides and it's a lot of research and it's a lot of time. Um, but no pressure really. Uh, my mission is to, <laughs> my mission isn't to get rich. My mission is to simply just, you know, take away the, you know, erase all the colors on the coloring book. Right. <laughs> um, and, and that's knowledge that should be free to everybody. Um, but yeah, it, it does take time and it does take work. So if, if you can, and you, you feel the need to, you're very, you're more than welcome to donate. Um, but yeah, uh, that's how just, just reach out to me. I'll gladly send it to you. And that's about it. Well, thank you for writing this amazing work. And I know that it's going to help a lot of people. So kudos to you for doing that. And I'm very appreciative of, of it too. And I'm thankful to have you as a friend now and to be on my show. It's just been wonderful to get to know you and see your brilliance and all this. You're a great teacher. Oh, and I just. <laughs> You're welcome. And I just encourage everyone to check out the Exodus Project because you have some phenomenal, phenomenal videos on there. Thanks. If you were interested in finding out about the shameless and shocking lies told by Christianity, don't hesitate to request your free copy of the Christian Coloring Book by Steve Eisenhower. Eisenhower's book also offers seekers and followers of the one true God the most concise, accurate and meticulously researched information available for spiritual growth, as well as counter-missionary work. Request it today by sending an email to rediscoveringgod22 at gmail.com.